everyone. Thanks for coming by. This is Whistlekick, Martial Arts Radio, episode 331. Today, we're talking all about Funakoshi, Gitchin Funakoshi. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your founder here at Whistlekick. I'm your host on this show. I love martial arts. So I made it my life and my job. And it's great. It's a great time. I get to talk to all of you. I get to spend pretty much from sunup to sundown working on this amazing project that is Whistlekick. You can find everything we've got going on at whistlekick.com. You can find us on social media. We're at Whistlekick. And of course, you can find us here on this show, which is all over the place. It's in podcast feeds. It's at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. It's on YouTube. There's a lot going on. We've been doing a lot of these profile episodes lately because it gives you and it gives me context for what's going on as we talk about these people, these places, these occurrences in the history of martial arts. And of course, the name Gishin Funakoshi has come up quite a few times on this show. So let's learn more about him. Gishin Funakoshi is often called the father of modern karate, particularly of Shotokan karate do. He's one of the most renowned figures in martial arts for spreading the practice of karate to the Japanese mainland from Okinawa in 1922. Funukoshi was a student of karate masters Anko Itosu, who we just talked about a few weeks ago, and Anko Asato. He became a karate teacher at many universities in Japan, and he became the emeritus chief instructor of the Japan Karate Association at the age of 80. Funukoshi was born on November 10th, 1868, in the district of Yamakawa Cho in Shuri, Okinawa, the same year when the Meiji Restoration occurred. He was born prematurely and was often sick. Because of his frail body, he received the utmost care from his parents and grandparents as they thought he wouldn't live long. Funukoshi lived with his mother's parents during his childhood. His grandfather taught him the four books and five classics of Confucianism as part of the knowledge requirements for the Shizoku, or the privileged class. When he attended primary school, he became close friends with one of his classmates, whose father was Azato Yosutsuni, also known as Anko Asato. Azato, as Funakoshi described him, was, quote, one of the Okinawa's greatest experts in the art of karate. In fact, Azato was not only an expert in karate, but in other disciplines as well, such as kendo, archery, and horsemanship. Funakoshi believed that he was very lucky to know and be known by Azato. Funakoshi eventually learned karate from Azato through secret training sessions because karate practice was banned by the government at that time. Apparently, students were strictly advised to keep hush about it. Given this situation, Funakoshi's training sessions with Azato were only done at night and only in Azato's house. He was still living with his grandparents back then, and Azato's house was pretty far away. However, he didn't mind the distance and patiently walked during the night just to learn karate from Azato. Because of the regular long walks that he had, he noticed that his health improved greatly. He was no longer sickly as he was before. Funakoshi enjoyed karate, but more than this, he felt indebted to the art because it improved his entire well-being. At that time, he decided to make karate a way of life. Funakoshi falsified his birth records by changing the year to 1870 to meet the requirements set by the Tokyo Medical School as only those who were born after 1870 were eligible to take the entrance examination. He passed that entrance exam, but he didn't pursue studying in the school because of the top knot controversy in the Meiji era. The government abolished the top knot, which was an ancient Japanese hairstyle that symbolized manhood. This caused a huge uproar to the Okinawans, and Funakoshi strongly opposed this change himself. As the Tokyo Medical School refused to accept students who wanted to retain the top knot, Funakoshi looked for alternatives. He decided to be a school teacher using his knowledge in the Chinese classics. However, the top-knot hairstyle was still a hindrance for him, and at this time, he decided to cut it off. He felt that it was inevitable because of the massive changes that were occurring everywhere in Japan. He also thought that it was obligatory for him as a teacher to mold the younger generation in order to make his nation better in the future. In 1888, he handled a classroom for the first time. He was 21 years old. Funakoshi was anxious, thinking about what his family would say when they saw he'd cut off his topknot. When he went home, his father was furious, while his mother 
was even more so. So furious that she left the house and fled to her parents' home. Despite his parents' outright rejection, he continued in his profession for the next 30 years. During this time, he was teaching. Funakoshi didn't leave karate behind. He taught during the day and practiced karate during the night in his master Azato's house. His neighbors were bewildered as to where he was going at all hours of the night, and they even thought he was secretly going to a brothel. Funakoshi practiced every single night in the backyard of Azato's house. Determined to master his master's teachings, he would practice a single kata for months. He would not stop the exhausting training until Azato became satisfied. Azato was clearly stern in the way that he taught Funakoshi, even if Azato was already old. The highest praise that Funakoshi received from Azato after showing him a kata was good. I think some of us have had instructors like that. In the morning after the training sessions, Azato would become a different kind of teacher, according to Funakoshi. Azato would discuss the essence of a karate and ask him about his work, just like a parent asking his child. After this, Funakoshi would walk home while being attentive to his skeptical neighbors. Funakoshi not only learned karate from Azato, but also from a close friend of Azato, whose name was Enko Itosu. Itosu was a great karate master himself, and Funakoshi learned a lot from the discussions of both masters. Funakoshi could not appreciate these two masters more, as they molded Funakoshi to what he had become. There were a lot of misconceptions about karate that Funakoshi wanted to clear up. He took the nukite, or the spear hand technique, as an example. He once heard someone who claimed to be an authority in karate say that the nukite could be used to tear off the ribs of one's opponent using only the five fingers of one hand. It was said that through constant training to the hands, the hands would be reshaped, quote, horrifically and be stronger. The training involved thrusting one's hand into a cask full of beans, then sand, pebbles, and lastly, pellets of lead. Another example was the superhuman grip that could tear off a man's flesh. According to those who claimed it was true, one should train lifting two heavy buckets, using only the fingertips, and then swing them around. They claimed that once maximum strength of one's grip was reached, flesh could be ripped off easily from a man's body. Funakoshi recalled his master Itosu crushing a thick bamboo stem with his bare hand. While this was an extraordinary feat, Funakoshi believed that Itosu's strength was a gift and not attained through torturous training, though it was indeed an enhanced through physical training. He also believed that a man could certainly attain extraordinary feats of strength, but he could only reach a certain level and no farther, as he knew that there was a limit to enhancing one's physical strength. Funakoshi criticized this, these so called nonsense techniques because the true definition of karate was obscured by these baseless claims. The people who exaggerated the martial art would convince others that karate was something to be frightened of. Moreover, these claims didn't have anything to do with karate at all, but were really only about mere strength, which could be acquired through practice, which any man could do regardless of martial arts. There were four types of primary school instructors when Funakoshi began his teaching career. Those who taught in elementary classes, those who taught in higher grades, special courses, and those who served as assistants. Funakoshi started as an assistant, but that was only for a short time he passed the examination for him to qualify as an instructor for elementary classes. Afterwards, he was promoted and was transferred to Naha, which gave him more time to practice karate. After some time, he was promoted again to teach in higher grades. Since he wasn't a graduate of a teacher's training college, he realized that further promotion would be slow. The principal of his school recommended him to be promoted to a higher post, but he declined it. That promotion would have forced him to travel to remote places which would have made him far, quite far, from his karate masters. In fact, his stay at Naha was permitted by his superiors, but for a reason. It's because of the top knot controversy. The government's mandate of banning the top knot was not observed in Okinawa in any way whatsoever. For Funakoshi, it was a trivial matter, but that was not the case with the Ministry of Education. The ministry ordered that all students should be shaved of their top knot, or else the students would not be allowed to enter school. The scissors-wielding teachers could not do anything, as many of the students knew karate. That's the reason why Funakoshi, who was known to be quite skilled with karate at that time, was asked to handle these students. 
being more skilled than the students, the students were helpless and finally submitted themselves to the shears. Funakoshi continued to train in karate, and he had more masters other than Azato and Itosu. He had Master Kiyuna, Master Tuno, Master Nigaki, and Master Matsumura, who were all known experts. Despite having many masters, Funakoshi still spent most of his time with his two original masters, as he learned not only karate from them, but other things, including politics from Azato. Originally, the kara in karate meant Chinese, but there's also another quite different character with the same pronunciation that meant empty. Therefore, one could interpret it as Chinese hands or empty hands. In the 1920s in Tokyo, Chinese was preferred instead of the other definition, but it wasn't necessarily correct according to Funakoshi. He thought that since Okinawa was under Chinese influence for such a long time, and that the imported goods from China were usually of excellent quality, the Okinawans became more inclined to use Chinese instead of empty. As a result, the general population thought that karate was a form of Chinese boxing. One would quickly notice the difference between the Chinese style of boxing and karate. So karate, according to Funakoshi, was not in any way acquired from the Chinese. Funakoshi had the chance to express this sentiment in Keio University at a karate research group. He suggested that karate should be renamed Dai Nippon Kempo Karate Do, or Great Japan Fist Method Empty Hands Way. As expected, he received large criticism, not only in Japan, but from Okinawa. But he stood by his change. Eventually, people acknowledged it. According to Funakoshi, the word empty was more appropriate rather than Chinese, as the martial art obviously uses no weapons. More than this, the objective of Karate Do students is to empty their, quote, heart and mind of all earthly desire and vanity, which is also in line with Buddhist scripture. In 1921, the Okinawa Prefecture was one of the invited participants for an ancient Japanese martial arts demonstration that was held in the Women's Higher Normal School in Tokyo. Funukoshi was invited by the Department of Education to introduce karate on behalf of all Okinawans. Of course, Funukoshi agreed instantly. As Funukoshi was planning to return to Okinawa after the demonstration, he was approached by one of the greatest martial arts masters, Kano Jigoro, the founder of Judo. He was asked by Kano for a brief lecture about the art of karate. At first, Funukoshi was hesitant as he felt his knowledge wasn't sufficient to teach such a great master, but Kano persisted. Funukoshi agreed to demonstrate some kata for Kano in the Kodokan Judo Hall. Funukoshi thought that only a few people would come to watch, but to his astonishment, there were more than 100 people waiting for him when he arrived. After the demonstration, Kano asked him how long it would take a person to master the kata he had just demonstrated. Funukoshi told him that it would take at least a year. Kano said that was far too long, so he asked Funukoshi to teach him only the basic ones. Funukoshi agreed right away, feeling honored with Kano's request. One morning, after Funakoshi's memorable encounter with Kano, he was called upon by a painter named Hoan Kosugi. Kosugi asked him to remain in Tokyo for some more time to teach him and his group the Tabata Poplar Club. After several sessions, Funakoshi realized that if he wanted karate to proliferate all over Japan, he was the man to start that, and that Tokyo was a good place to begin. He wrote a letter to his masters, Azato and Itosu, about his plan, and they both agreed and even encouraged him but also left him a warning that it would be a very difficult job. The warning from his masters proved to be more than right, as Funakoshi experienced a life harder, far harder, than he had experienced in Okinawa. He started by moving into a student dormitory named Meisei-juku, where he rented a tiny room. He got permission to use the lecture hall as a temporary dojo during the times when it wasn't in use. While the place seemed to be fine, the problem was money. He had no money and his family couldn't send him any either. He couldn't attract sponsors because karate was still unknown. Thus, Funakoshi needed a plan to earn money to support himself. He took all sorts of odd jobs at the dormitory, such as being a watchman, a caretaker, a gardener, and even swept rooms. He had students, but just a few, and the fees weren't enough even for his monthly food bill. He convinced the dormitory cook to take karate lessons, and in exchange, the cook would give him a discount on the food. It was, without a doubt, a difficult life for Funakoshi. One day, Funakoshi thought 
Maybe he would pawn something, but he realized he had nothing valuable to pawn. He found an old hat and a hand-woven kimono from Okinawa, and he decided to pawn them. So he packed them up carefully and went to a distant pawn shop because he didn't want his students to know. Upon arriving at the pawn shop, he handed the items to the clerk. And he was ashamed because he thought they were of little, maybe even no value. The clerk took the items and brought them to the back room. Munikoshi heard conversations and whispers, and after a while, the clerk reappeared. To his surprise, Funikoshi was handed a huge sum of money. He later learned that the clerk's younger brother, the voice that the clerk was talking to in the back room, was a former karate student of Funikoshi's. Funikoshi was very grateful to his benefactors, including Hon Kusugi and the other painters in the Tabata Poplar Club. Because of these good people, he now had money, and he was able to continue spreading the word of karate in Japan. Funakoshi's situation improved eventually when the number of students grew. Many of them were white collar workers who came to his dojo after a day's work. Luckily for him, his students loved the art and were enthusiastic in perfecting their skills. The knowledge of karate had spread to many people in just a short time. Even some of the professors and students from Keio University came to Funakoshi's dojo to learn karate. Eventually, a karate study group was formed in the university, the first of its kind. So aside from his responsibilities in the dojo, he was also working in the university, serving as an instructor. Not for long, though, as another university named Takushoku came to seek his service in teaching karate there. One day, a wealthy-looking man came to Funakoshi's dormitory together with a young man in a student's uniform. He was requested to perform a karate demonstration, and the young man immediately expressed his interest in learning the art. He later learned that the man was Kichinosuke Saigo, who later became a member of the House of Representatives after the Second World War. Studying at the Pierce School at that time, the young man rented in Togokan Lodging House, which was near Funakoshi's dojo and far from his school. Out of concern, Funakoshi told the owner of the lodging house that one of his tenants was an aristocrat, so the owner immediately decided to move the young man to a better lodging house. This young man studied under Funakoshi for several years and went to his dojo every day. The number of schools and universities that sought Funakoshi's instruction grew. Among them was Waseda, Osei, Nippon Medical College, Tokyo Imperial University, the Tokyo University of Commerce, and the Tokyo University of Agriculture. He was also invited to teach at the Nakaido College of Physical Education, working with military and naval schools. The parents of the students also paid him visits to thank him for the positive changes that happened with their sons. He was told that their sons became healthier and stronger because of karate. These visits were significant to Funakoshi, and he was extremely grateful to the parents who expressed their sincere thanks. Funakoshi became busier and busier as the number of people who wanted to learn karate grew. As he was confident they could support his entire family in Tokyo, he wrote to his wife, inviting her to move there. However, she firmly refused, even though all their sons were already living in Tokyo. She wanted to stay in Okinawa to perform her religious duties as a Buddhist, even though she supported Funakoshi in his work. Funakoshi finally conceded, seeing that his wife's decision wouldn't change, even though it meant years of them not seeing each other. On September 1st, 1923, an earthquake struck Tokyo called the Great Kanto Earthquake. With a magnitude of 7.9, it left casualties of more than 100,000 people. Many of Funakoshi's students died in that incident, and those who survived, including Funakoshi, helped the ones in need of food and medical attention, and they also helped in disposing of the dead bodies. The teaching of karate was temporarily postponed during that time. Funakoshi didn't have any money to build his own dojo, though a good friend let him share his temporarily. Years later, in 1935, a committee of karate supporters pulled together enough funds on a national scale to erect the very first karate dojo in Japan. In 1936, Funakoshi arrived at the newly erected dojo. He saw a sign over the door with the dojo's new name, Shoto Kan. Funakoshi didn't know why the karate committee chose his pen name, Shoto, the name that he used for his Chinese poems. This made him, without a doubt, very proud and very happy. However, it also made him sad, because his master Sasato and Itosu 
had passed away, and he would have loved to watch them teach in his new dojo. Funakoshi was already old at this time, and he knew that his years were limited, so he started to do his job. One of his first tasks was to set up the rules and the class schedules at the dojo, as well as formalizing the requirements for rank. However, Funakoshi had a problem, but it was a good problem. The number of students grew and grew until the dojo couldn't accommodate all the people who wanted to learn. The dojo was just one of his duties. Many universities also set up their karate groups, and they needed instructors, and clearly Funakoshi wouldn't be able to handle all of them. Therefore, he assigned advanced students to be the instructors for those groups. He also assigned his third son to assist him in running the dojo, while he supervised the classes held in different locations. Funakoshi was often asked why he chose the pen name Shoto. It literally means pine waves in Japanese, and seems to have no significance with karate. But the truth is, he chose that pen name with a reason, and he explained it well. Back in the day, in his teen years, he used to travel to Mount Toro near his town. Whenever the wind blew, he listened to the rustling of the pines, and according to him, one could feel the, quote, deep, impenetrable mystery that lies at the root of all life, and it sounded like a celestial music. On another occasion, when he was in his 20s, he used to go to a park called Okunoyama. The park featured beautiful pine trees and a large lotus pond. Here, he enjoyed his solitude while listening to the wind rustling through the pines, which he always loved. Through the years of practicing karate, he became more and more attracted, attached to nature. He had peace of mind whenever he listened to the rustling of the pines, and this helped him to be a more peaceful person. Funakoshi's wife died in the 1930s from severe asthma in Oito, Kyushu, where she was also cremated. He was with his wife during her last days after being separated physically for many years. This saddening incident didn't hinder Funakoshi from his obligations. He returned to Tokyo in 1947, carrying his wife's ashes, and continued teaching karate to tens of thousands of people. The last years were still full of activities, despite his old age. He was able to write several books, such as Karate Do Kyohan, the master text, and Karate Do, My Way of Life, his autobiography, which he wrote before he died at the age of 90. Unikoshi died in 1957 from colon cancer and was buried in Toshimagoka Cemetery. On December 1st, 1968, a memorial was built for him at a Buddhist temple named Engakuji, located in Kamakura. I have to confess, after reading this and revising it, and then reading it to all of you, it seems pretty clear to me that nearly a hundred years ago, martial arts had some of the same challenges that it has today. But here, this man that so many of us look up to as a martial arts pioneer saw martial arts not only as a physical discipline, but something so much more. That's my big takeaway from reading this. Whether you're a Shotokan practitioner, a karate practitioner, maybe you're not even a Japanese martial arts practitioner, I think it would be hard to find any martial arts practitioner these days who in some way hasn't been influenced by the work of Gichin Funakoshi. Hmm. Pretty powerful when we get to see one of these things that at least tangentially has influenced all of us. I want to thank you for listening. I hope you learned something. I certainly did. Powerful stuff. I love this stuff. I love history. I don't think we can truly know where we're at unless we know where we've came from. Come from? There was a lot of words that I just read. Once in a while I stumble. But I think you get the point. If you want, there's a transcript. I went off script a bit at times, but you can certainly check that out. You can find it at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We'll have some photos of Funakoshi up there. And of course, whether you're a Shotokan practitioner or not, what do you think? What did you think of this episode? What do you think of Funakoshi's legacy? Leave some comments. We don't get as many comments on 
the website, as I would love to see. Because comments lead to conversation. Conversation leads to understanding. And I think that that's critical to the mission that is this podcast. If you want to follow us on social media, you can find us. We are at Whistlekick on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. You can find us on YouTube. You can email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. This was a bit of a longer Thursday episode. Let me know what you think. Do you like as we go this deep? Or do you prefer the more surface, cursory examinations of a person or a topic? I want to hear from you. But for now, I'm going to let you go. That's all I got. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Mm-hmm.